Welcome back to another exciting episode of Archaeology After Dark. I am your host, Daniel Rhodes, and my guest today is Emily Jane Murray. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm ready to, to take on the topic of fermentation here. <laughs> right on. So uh, before we do that, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I am a public archaeologist who works with the Florida Public Archaeology Network, and I work in the beautiful uh, St. Augustine, Florida. So I work kind of in Northeast Florida um, and I live in St. Augustine. Um, and I do, you know, outreach and education. And I, uh, I joke, I run my, I get paid to run my mouth about archaeology for a living. So, um, but uh, a lot of my research focuses on heritage at risk and um, climate change. And we do a lot with historic cemeteries as well. And um, I dabble with, um, yeast and fermentation and mushrooms and all of these fun things um, in my personal life. And then, you know, any excuse to to bring things into my professional life. So oh, yeah. uh, I'm not an expert and I don't do uh, sediment analysis or anything like that, but I've read a few books, so. <laughs> I've read some books too. And sediment is, you know, fast. I mean, it's fascinating to sediment people, but I, I just see it as dirt and I'm like, okay, this is dirt. Dirt isn't going to change if I look at it anymore or any less. <laughs> it's, it's like science magic too. When you start like getting those little tiny bits and you like run it through the mass spectrometer. And I'm like, those are some lines on a chart, but they will give you all sorts of fantastic information based on it. So I'm, I am in awe of those skills. So I mean, it's a beautiful chart. The charts I've seen are very pretty. You know, somebody worked really hard to put them together. I can't read it, but it's a great presentation. <laughs> yes, luckily, uh, the public don't quiz you too hard on those charts. And, uh, you know, you just put a few up and they're like, Oh, yeah, it looks impressive. And I'm like, Yeah, that means fish. And they're like, Okay. <laughs> so. And then, you know, you start saying things like 10YR, 4YR and stuff like that at them. And they're like, can you just say like brown or yellow or red? And I'm like, that's not very scientific, but I can. I mean, if it makes it easier for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So back to the topic of fermentation, where, uh, where would you like to start? Um, should we start with fermentation itself? I'm yeah, go for it. Just about the science of it. So um, fermentation uh, is another type of magic that happens. So um, it is a anaerobic process, a process by which little tiny organisms eat things and then they create byproducts. And um, some of our favorite byproducts include alcohol and CO2. Um, but there's all sorts of other things that get uh, produced depending on what kind of organism it is, or, you know, there's yeast and bacteria and all sorts of things that happen. Um, and the thing that I'm always amazed with is like, we consume far more fermented things than we realize. So of course, you know, things like beer and wine and bread, but like yogurt's fermented or cheese is, is fermented, you know, anything that has an active culture is technically um, some, some type of this process that's happening. So. For those of you who are watching this and are outside of the United States, the things she just mentioned are the cornerstones of the American diet. Alcohol, <laughs> cheese, bread, yogurt forms a nice little triangle. We call it the food pyramid here. Yes. I mean, you could waste your time fermenting pickles, but uh, no. <laughs> so when, uh, when do we first, like not like a specific date or anything, but where do we first start seeing this process in, you know, history? Well, so it's interesting because there's tons and tons and tons of speculation about the earliest fermentation and like fermentation will just happen spontaneously. So um, lots of fruits will naturally ferment, uh, palm trees. There's certain kinds of palm trees that have these like perfectly engineered um, shapes where it like collects water and then the sap and then, you know, you get little bugs landing in there that bring yeast in and then it starts fermenting. Um, if you add water to honey, so if you had like a a beehive that fell on the ground and filled up with water, like it would start to naturally ferment. Um, so there's tons and tons of speculation about like our, you know, human ancestors and going back way, way far, thousands of years and hundreds of thousands of years. And um, we don't really know, you know, basically when people first had fermented things because it would have been something that occurred and they enjoyed. Um, but it's probably about 10,000 years ago where we find the earliest evidence of people going, 
hmm, that's good. I'm going to make that happen and start like actually trying to purposefully create fermented goods. I know one thing uh, I actually learned this from a video game is uh, that the Mongolians, when they started conquering Asia, used to drink uh, fermented milk as part of their mm -hmm. celebratory conquest. I'm going to call it conquest because that's the nicest way I can put it. Yeah, I think that's called kumis, and um, they still make that today. Uh, and the stories that I've heard is that they would fill up a, a pouch with milk and then just let it ferment all day. And then you'd have something tasty when you make camp that night and you just like fill it up. Um, and some of it's made of horse milk, at least uh, with some of the nomadic tribes that were wandering around the, the, the steppes of Siberia and all. So, uh, but people, as I say, still enjoy that today. So you can go find some and try it. <laughs> I would, I would try it. Yeah, I'd try it once. I mean, <laughs> probably not again after that, but trying it once, you know, I'm down for that. Never know. It could be our new favorite thing. <laughs> yeah, I know what I'm getting my parents for Christmas when I come back from that trip. <laughs> Mom, Dad, you're going to hate this, but you're going to love it for, you know, a couple minutes. <laughs> so what, what does this have to do with archaeology? I mean, the fermentation process. Yeah, so at its basic level, um, archaeologists study people and people make fermented things. So, you know, we're interested in um, what people do and if people are doing this thing, we want to learn more about it. Um, so we can find evidence of it archaeologically, which is pretty cool. Um, and, you know, a lot of these things are kind of important cultural practices that we have, you know, imagine uh, gathering uh, without beverages or, you know, eating without bread or, you know, some of these things are, are pretty important to the traditions that we carry on today. So, um, but we can find all sorts of, we can find the actual fermented goods. So we have like um, charred bread loaves that are thousands of years old from all over the world. Or we have, um, as I was saying, that sediment that ends up in the bottom of vessels. So, you know, if you start off with a glass of beer and you let it lay around for a couple thousand years, maybe it just all evaporates into schmutz in the bottom. And um, so we can look at that and, and explore more. And they've even found things like um, bottles full of wine on shipwrecks, which are always very fun to read the flavor profiles when people get gutsy enough to try those. And I think I think I would be not gutsy enough to try that one. Considering it's been in the ocean for probably 200 years, I wouldn't want to try that. I mean, yeah. on a dare, if somebody was paying me to do it, I might, but yeah. 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 But, you know, thinking of artifacts and fermentation, you know, when people show, you know, artifacts from Pompeii or something, they'll actually show you like a vulcanized loaf of bread like it is a full-on loaf of bread and it is still like a single circular thing and I just made up the word vulcanized I don't think that's actually a thing I think it's I mean, car carbonized but I like vulcanized because I'm a big trekkie yeah, there yeah. You go. I can't do that thing with my fingers I'm just gonna work on that. <laughs> there you go and, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up that today is, in fact, May 4th. May the 4th be with you, everybody. Star Wars Day. Celebrate that. Yes. Uh, my husband is, is the Star Wars. So we celebrate it in our household as well. So may the 4th be with you also. <laughs> <laughs> so when people find bottles of wine, beer, or things like that that have been, you know, in the ground in a shipwreck, they can actually break it down to figure out what was in it at the time. Yeah, so there's certain markers that we can find. Um, so for instance, if it had, if something has, has had honey in it, you can often find beeswax because no matter, even with our fancy processing today, there will always be little bits of beeswax that's left in honey. So that's like a good thing. If you identify beeswax, you know, you have honey. There's certain um, things that you can find um, like certain acids that are associated with grapes or sometimes you can even find things like grape skins or grape seeds or you know different fruit skins or fruit seeds um, and folks can also look for microscopic like the yeast themselves you know find those tiny little microscopic organisms that were um, creating the fermented goods so. so I assume when you find something like this you can actually trace it to the place that it was created like say different wines would have ingredients that were specific to like, say, 
Spain or France, but it would be different from something that was made here at the time. Um, yeah, in some ways, and we can, um, you know, the, the, so different ingredients grow in different places. So we can see different traditions that, you know, come up from, from different places based on that. So we have, you know, corn that grows over here. So folks are making uh, alcoholic beverages out of corn in, you know, Central and South America versus they have grapes over in the Mediterranean. And so that's where you end up with all the grape beverages. Um, but we can also, you know, in more recent times, look for things like um, wine bottle seals, you know, and they may tell you where the, the, uh, bottle originated and that can um, be cool to kind of trace it around or um, you know different bottle styles of bottles or, or ways of shipping things around so the Spanish put a lot of things in um, what we call olive jars those big amphora looking coarse earthenware vessels in the you know um, so you can kind of see where, where some of the accoutrement come from as well and figure out where where the things came from to begin with. When I saw a uh... So we actually, I actually saw a lecture you gave uh, with FPAN on this same subject. And while I was watching that, I thought, you know, in, you know, 100 years, 200 years from now, somebody's going to find like a bottle of Mountain Dew in an archaeological site somewhere. And they're going to try to break it down and recreate it and call it redo or something ridiculous. <laughs> that would be, oh, yeah, that's an interesting concept. And I mean, you know, we do find like, Pepsi bottles or like some of like Coke bottles that are technically historic artifacts. So some of these things have been around that like the items are already considered archeological sites. Um, I think it's been a few years now, but um, pop tops from beer cans are now considered archeological, you know, historic artifacts. So, um, you know, we already have kind of our modern beverages that are part of the historic record. So for those of you who aren't aware of this, um... Coca-Cola in the 60s and 70s actually did have cocaine in it. So should you find one, don't drink it right away because that's probably not the best thing for you. It would be interesting uh, if it preserves better with all the crazy things they were putting in <laughs> the beverages back then. <laughs> I wonder if it makes the colors more vivid or something. <laughs> makes but you see the colors more vivid. <laughs> it has a very distinct earthy taste to it, along with the taste of the cocaine. <laughs> so yeah. how do uh, people go about transporting, you know, things that are, do they have to like preserve it in a certain way while it's being transported here or they just brought it? Um, back in, back in the historic times? Um, yes. Yeah, they would try to seal. One of the interesting things, um, we don't actually know how they would seal like some of the um, amphora. Sorry, I have a visitor coming to join us here. Oh. Um, <laughs> bonus guest. Um, so we don't actually know how they would seal like some of these ancient amphora, especially like in the Mediterranean. Um, and so that's like one of the big mysteries is like, how, how did they seal? Um, but yeah, they would put them in big, you know, big pots, big clay pots. Um, when glass becomes, you know, really a bigger deal, we start to see things getting shipped around in, um, you know, glass bottles. Uh, beer gets shipped around in kegs, big, you know, wooden kegs, like you think of. Uh, and one of my favorite stories about beer is that, you know, they were the British. Uh, we have a, a beverage style today called an IPA, an Indian Pale Ale, and so the British were trying to figure out how to ship beer to their colonies in India and it kept going bad. And they figured out if they put a lot more hops in it, that it is a, uh, it has like preservation agents to it. Like there's something about the hops that cause better preservation. So the beer wouldn't spoil. So they, but they ended up with the super hoppy beer. So that's kind of the origins of that, um, that style of beer. And in fact, we see like a switch in the medieval period. Part of the, the rationale that we think happens is that they, they switch from uh, different flavoring agents um, to the hops because the hops will help the beer stay fresher for longer, so. Because I imagine, you know, keeping it cold back then was difficult because they didn't have things like refrigeration or trucks. You gotta think about those good British styles. You know, even today they don't serve their beer ice cold like we do in America, so. I have some theories about that. Like the colder a Bud Light tastes, uh, the colder the Bud Light is, the better it tastes because you don't really taste it as much. So, um, but yeah, they just wouldn't have had cold beer like we think of. Yeah, because, you know, nobody wants warm beer. I mean, nobody wants that. 
I mean, depends people, on the beer style. That's, there are that's some true. good beers that are served warmer. That's true. That's fair. That's fair. And if you're in a cooler climate like you are in Europe, you know, compared to Florida, right? Like nothing's going to be a pleasant I mean, temperature just, when it's outside in Florida. So, and, and, you know, colder places like Chicago or something, you just leave it in your car overnight and it's fine. Open your window, shove your bottles down in the snow. Who needs a refrigerator? I have seen people. You know, you see some strange things on Facebook and then you see something like that and you're like, okay, this is human ingenuity at its finest that people are, you know, coming up with a creative way to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is why people stand the snow. <laughs> I'm like, why would people voluntarily live here? And I'm like, outside refrigeration. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. So the reason I thought this was an interesting topic, aside from what we've already talked about, is there are several, you know, beverage companies. Uh, I know Dogfish has done this where they bring in like an archaeologist or an anthropologist and they attempt to recreate a recipe that they've, you know, pieced back together from, say, Turkey. I know that's one that they've used. It's one of their, uh, it sounded like it was one of their better selling ones. Yeah, that became almost one of their like standards. Um, and there's so many of these kinds of projects that like I can't actually keep up anymore, which is really exciting to see. Um, but Dogfish Head was one of the first companies and they worked with a gentleman named uh, Dr. Patrick McGovern, who I believe was at the University of Pennsylvania. He was up that ways. Um, and he was somebody who looked, he did like the isotopic analysis of the sediment um, and uh, the, yeah, they started just trying to recreate uh, beverages based on like what they found that were in those vessels. And so he's done, uh, it was called the Ancient Ale Series and he had several from all over the world. Uh, there's a, one from China, one from uh, uh, Central America. They, they actually got, there was a whole, one of the great American beer fests, they all got together and like chewed corn and made like tradition, chicha in the traditional style and like served it there. Um, but there's a lot of other companies that have started doing this. Um, there's companies who have gotten beer bottles off of shipwrecks and they've actually been able to harvest the yeast that was in those bottles. And then they made beer um, with the historic yeast. Uh, there's other companies who will just try to replicate recipes, um, you know, that may have been written down in other places uh, or just trying to think about what the traditional styles would be and trying to replicate them that way. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of things going on and lots of folks getting back into like, you know, heirloom grains or um, things like that. Uh, we think of barley as being the kind of staple uh, part of beer, but you know, there's been tons and tons of grains used all over the world through time. So thinking about different uh, ingredients as well. So when they're putting all this back together, like they can actually see the breakdown when it's being, I guess, I said breakdown, they're breaking it apart and analyzing it. They could actually, you know, get down to like the tiny, tiny details of what actually went into it. Uh, in some ways, sometimes it can be a little bit of a guess, but like I say, there's certain markers they look for. Um, and like, I think some of them, they might just be like other botanicals that they aren't sure about, or, you know, also just thinking about what would have been available at the time or what they may see in historic records. Um, so, you know, none of it's an exact recipe that they're getting. There are old beer recipes or old wine recipes, but none of, you know, these recreations are exact. They're just kind of making their best guess based on, you know, all the evidence that they have. Well, I mean, I'm thinking about it, you know, somebody's recreating a historic beer recipe and they're, you know, having question marks at some of the ingredients. They're like, well, you know, we do have these really neat flowers growing outside and they smell nice. Let's just throw those in there too. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that's what people did in the past too. Ooh, this tastes good. I wonder what happens if I put it in my beer. Ooh, this tastes good. I wonder what happens if I let it ferment, you know? No, you have to understand that at some point, beer was only made by monks, so you have to refer to it as D and thou and wear a gaudy brown robe while you do it. And live That's high. not quite true. <laughs> the monks do take over, but it's uh, actually only like a thousand years ago. Um, and there's a long history of women as brewers. Um, that happens in like some of the jokes that I've heard is just like, yeah, women were the brewers until the men realized that it was a very lucrative business and then they took over. <laughs> so. We can make money doing this. We need to take over. <laughs> yeah. So. 
like Samuel Adams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if he was a brewer. I guess he did brew. He's not like the biggest of the brewing founding fathers, though. Like they found um, a, a distillery at George Washington's uh, at Mount Vernon. Um, and they found like a wine seal at James Madison's uh, at Montpelier. Um, so we, there are a lot of uh, founding fathers who are into drinking, but I mean, they also didn't have the commercial industry that we have today. So at that yeah, they point, didn't they have had- the process. I imagine has changed a lot with uh, you know globalization, colonization, cultural expansions, and things like that. That we could actually you know exchange one culture's ingredients for another and put them together in the blender I'm going to call it the blender because I don't know what it is and create something that you know everybody in the world can enjoy well and we can ship it around the world too in ways that it will still taste really good and can get there really quickly and you know that's some of it too or we can get ingredients um that like like beer ingredients don't really grow that well here in Florida. Um, you know, hops and barley aren't really tropical plants. Uh, a lot of the grape varieties don't really do here do well here, except for like muscadines and like no no offense to those who love them, but uh, muscadine wine is not my favorite wine. So, um, not that great. Uh, anyways, if you're into it, it's great. I'm sure, but uh, I am not into it. So. Um, so we can also just get, you know, or even just different like herbs or spices or, or flavorings that we can add, you know, to beverages too. Uh, even something like a lemon, right? A lemon comes from, or citrus often comes from like Asia. Um, like SDM Adams, I think has, a, has like citrus in it and has like grains of paradise, which is I think from like Africa somewhere. And then like barley, which I guess starts in the Middle East. And, uh, you know, so just to think about like all of the, the things that go into your beer um, are from all over the world. So, and we're also seeing um, uh, a lot of the breweries are they're just becoming these mass conglomerates as well. So like AB InBev was, uh, it's, it was like Belgian and then it was bought by Brazil and then it like ate up Anheuser-Busch. And so like, it's this global company now that makes tons and tons of beers and they are even buying up, you know, all these little American breweries too and like adding to the fold. So if you go to the grocery store, it's like, you know, most of the beers on the shelf are owned by like two or three just gl- huge global corporations, so. I always thought it was interesting. Uh, I heard this in a history class I took, you know, four or five years ago that Yingling actually started out as an ice cream company. Hmm. I have not heard that. I-, I thought that was really interesting that they, really did the full 360 on their image and stopped making ice cream and started making beer. It's a big pivot. It's a big pivot. I mean, it's interesting, you know, the history of the American breweries. Um, We had a ton and then basically like prohibition kind of tanked a lot of the breweries. So to see uh, the ones that are really old, like the things that they did during prohibition uh, to stay afloat, because a lot of the breweries just like couldn't, they didn't make beer. So I know they made a lot of like near beer or like malt, basically like malt sodas um, and different things. So there's a connection, a malt. If you're making malt, you could put ice cream and have like a malt milkshake, but I don't know. Now I'm just spitballing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know we first start seeing like people starting breweries here in America when, you know, German citizens started immigrating here in the late the early to mid 1800s, I think is when it was. I'm probably wrong on that. I'm sure somebody will correct me at some point being like, Daniel, you're not doing a lot of research into what you're saying. I'm like, well, okay. I mean, from my understanding, that's when beer got bigger and more popular. And that's when you start to see like the bigger companies, you know, all date to that time period. I think a lot of, um, there's a lot of cider before that, you know, so there there might've been some beer, probably, I'm sure there was beer. Um, but I think, you know, from my understanding, the founding fathers were bigger cider drinkers. And so. Well, I mean, also think about, you know, we didn't have the water quality assurances that we have now. So probably drinking an alcoholic fermented beverage of some kind was probably the healthier option than water out of a hole in your town. 
Yeah, I mean, just the fact that you boil it for, you know, 30 minutes or 60 minutes uh, will kill everything that's in it. And I think that was one of the reasons people got so excited about tea as well, because there's still a boiling process involved, but it's non-alcoholic. So uh, you can get a different kind of like caffeine buzz off of it, but it's it's still different than, um, than alcohol. And something else to keep in mind, you know, we think of, uh, you know, people, traditionally just drank tons and tons of beer and wine and cider in the past because they couldn't drink alcohol or sorry they couldn't drink water because it wasn't as safe um, a lot of those beers and wines and ciders weren't as as alcoholic so they would have been like there's something called like small beers and they were like you know one or two percent abv versus you know a standard abv today is like four or five percent so it, it they were not as alcoholic so you could drink them you know more of them and over longer periods of time without filling the full effects. And I'm thinking, you know, people are drinking these beverages, they're having three or four at a time, and then they're writing, you know, some of the most important documents in history, like Thomas Jefferson recovering from a hangover after writing the Declaration of Independence. Like, this sounds really good on paper, but in practice, I don't know if this is going to work, but it's okay. Yeah, one of the podcasts I listened to was talking about just like how gross like the constitutional congresses would have been. It was just like a bunch of dudes shoved in a room and it was hot and there's no AC and like they're all half drunk and like, <laughs> man, it makes the past like a little different to think about. <laughs> it, it makes me wonder if that's why there's like clarification issues in like the constitution, like they wrote down the right to bear arms, but doesn't really explain what that means. And, you know, on Family Guy, they said it's the right to hang a pair of bear arms on your wall. <laughs> yes. I'm like, okay, somebody might have been drinking a little bit. When they wrote this. Yeah. Like this can get into a whole other podcast topic here, but I'm like, well, I think not all of them meant for it to be taken so literally. <laughs> Yes, we'll we'll save the political issues for <laughs> something yeah. else when it's less taxing to talk about. <laughs> After we have many rounds of beers and ciders. <laughs> yes, for that for that episode, I'm going to need four or five people to show up, and I'm going to have to drink before I talk to all of them. So. Like today, my guests are these political scientists that I found, and they're all horribly, horribly boring. That's why I've been drinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I swear, I'm, I'm a professional when I do this program. I <laughs> so uh, what else? I mean, I know this is a really broad topic. What are some other areas that people could look at to see the connection between how they did fermentation things in the past to how they do it now? Um, I mean, there's tons of archaeological sites just everywhere, really. You know, any any town or city is, probably has some cool, like, tapering sites that you can find. Um, here in St. Augustine, there's uh, one, a site that the the foundation of the building was lined with like beer bottle, like the beer bottle or wine bottles or whatever bottles, like were the, um, like that was like the, the found, like the base of the foundation for the structure that was there. Um, so there's like speculation that it could have been a tavern, just, it was either a tavern or folks who were uh, very, very thirsty because it was a lot of bottles. Um, so that was really cool to see. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, interesting archaeology um, at like plantation sites. Um, so the the Caribbean became pretty dominant with sugar and on a lot of the islands, and um, a lot of that sugar was used to make rum. So and rum becomes a huge import into the states here. So um, and you know, so there's some interesting studies you can do looking into you know the the, the archaeology of of alcohol and, and that. But there's also a lot that kind of you can unpack there. You know, because a lot of enslaved people were sent. Uh, came, you know, were brought over to work those plantations and it was not a good life. It was not a pleasant task. And um, so there's a lot to, you know, a lot under the surface with some of these topics as well to, to really start to unpack and understand kind of the, the big ramifications of some of this industry that was happening. 
I know the introduction of like spices into the global economy really changed the way a lot of people just did things in general, like food tasted better, beverages were obviously better. It made people money and then they decided to throw the tea in the harbor because that, that tracks. Uh, what's the, the Hamilton quote? Like you saw what they did when they, they taxed the tea. Can you imagine what happens if they tax our whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh god the american revolution would have been so much worse for everybody if that had happened we could have gone into like a massive global mm -hmm. war kind of thing <laughs> that would have been world war one <laughs> <laughs> we're sober so the war has to continue all right fine let's go yeah <laughs> well, I mean, folks get in ingenuitive. That's another really interesting um, realm of, of archaeology of, of uh, the stills, like the moonshine stills and bootlegging. Like um, Florida actually had a lot of bootlegging that was going on because it was so close to the like, like Cuba and the Caribbean. So you could just do, you know, like the rum runners going back and forth to bring the, the liquor in. Or you see that a lot like on the Canadian border as well, where folks could get Canadian whiskey and bring it in really cheap. Um, and there's an archaeologist who works in Kentucky. He goes out and like works on um, moonshine stills in the woods to see where, where folks were. Uh, and they're always pretty elusive to find. Like they wanted them to be elusive when they were up and running. So they get even more elusive when they're kind of. I mean, decades. that's understandable. You know, you're running an illegal business. The last thing you want is some archaeologist poking around in your <laughs> very fragrant still saying, Okay, so a raccoon just fell in your still there, and he's like, yeah, that's fine, just leave it in there. <laughs> and he's like, um, okay, that I'm not <laughs> going to be having any of this. You just boil it long enough, it'll be fine. <laughs> it tastes kind of gamey when it comes out. New well, so I mean, what happens though if you put the peaches in or like apples in and then they get like they absorb it all? Like, does that happen with like raccoon thighs if you just like leave it floating in the moonshine? Do they get nice and like soaked in alcohol? I was wondering yeah, if when it came out, them. it had like little rings in the glass, like it does on the raccoon's tail or something. <laughs> or if you start like developing wicked dark circles around your eyes. <laughs> No, that's just from drinking all the moonshine. <laughs> uh, and then your vision slowly goes away because of the horrible moonshine. And they're like, well, was this worth it? No, not really. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it really speaks to human ingenuity that they put this much effort into creating something and people still being able to find it after so long or piece it together after you know two or three hundred years of it being in the ground in a cabinet or something yeah um and i mean it's a pretty interesting you know cultural it's pretty significant to a lot of the cultures i mean i guess if you think of it as being like pretty appellation and um there's a lot of writing on it. Like there's these books called, I think it's the Foxfire or Firefox. It's one of them. And it was, it was this high school class who to get the guy to get the kids interested in English language, he got them to start interviewing like the old timers and like recording all this stuff. So there's all sorts of instructions on how the bills still there. Um, but you know, we find them all over. Like there's several in Florida, there's some here in St. John's County where I live that we found. So, I mean, people are uh, they're, they're doing all sorts of, make, crafting all sorts of, of goods, you know, that you don't quite realize. Um, yeah, it's, you know, an interesting person who, you know, takes the time to really create a beverage like this that people tolerate, I guess, if it's moonshine. I don't know if it's necessarily drinking it to enjoy it, but, I mean, it's to, I guess, stay connected to the past kind of if you're not 
Well, I mean, the, it's taken off as like its own industry. Uh, like one of the distilleries in St. Augustine like makes a whole bunch of different moonshine, like tons of distilleries are making a whole bunch of moonshines. And then I'm like, but it's legally sanctioned. So how is it moonshine? But a lot of it's essentially just like unaged uh, corn liquor. Um, mm. So, I mean, like the, the practices continue today and have gotten popular again. And um, I guess the flavors are, I mean, they end up doing a lot to kind of disguise the, the flavor in certain ways, but a lot of fruits and spices and stuff. Yeah, that's the fun of, you know, experimenting with creating a beverage or something. You can just throw whatever you want to in it and just hope for the best and it, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad <laughs> and you uh, i'm a homebrewer so I, and you don't forget the mistakes you made in the process you're like well not gonna do this again the it doesn't taste good coming back up <laughs> um yeah i'm a homebrewer so i've done some experimenting um and i some of my most memorable beers were also my not uh, like, oh, we're gonna not do that again. Like I tried to put lavender in a beer and I just put way too much of it. So it was like eating a bar of soap. It was not very pleasant or. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it smelled nice, tastes nice, no. Yeah, it was a little much, so. <laughs> so how did you get into, I guess, home brewing? Was that like an archeological, like, fondness you had that you carried over into something or that was something different? I probably even started homebrewing before I got into archaeology and then I realized like oh there's this like awesome connection like with Patrick McGovern and the ancient eels so um yeah bringing together all my loves and I've recently gotten into mushrooms which is fun because like um yeast are technically fungus so I'm just like all of my passions <laughs> I'll go back to fungus so um so people could do the same things with fungi. That's the plural of that. I had to remind myself of what the plural of fungus is. Uh, they can do the same thing. Uh, what? I was going to say fungi or fungi, depending on who you ask. Oh, I've always heard it as fungi. fungi. So, I mean, I can go fun fungi. There we go. Is that right? Okay. Uh, you can do the same you, thing you with fungi. I think. Hmm? Yeah, you, you could probably, I mean, you could, I'm sure you could find like spores uh, and like microscopic things, like evidence of people eating them. Yeah. I'm having flashes of people eating cave mushrooms in the early days of humanity. I mean, mushrooms are like super nutritious though. They have uh, proteins and um, like they're, they, they're delicious. Um, so it would have been a really good food source. Like it still is a really good food source. And there's so many kinds and they, you know, grow. I mean, I, when I see things like that, I think about the guy who, you know, people followed his example and they were like, okay, he just died from eating this one. So we shouldn't do that, but we can try this one. Luckily, there's only like, the, the trope is like, yes, you're going to die from a bad mushroom, but like there's only actually a, a, a very small number of varieties that will kill you. Most will just give you like gastro, gastral intestinal distress. <laughs> um, we like to so put things as nice as we possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so you would just have a couple of really bad days and then you'd be like, I'm going to remember what that looked like and I'm not going to do it again. I'm going to draw a picture of it on this wall so people will both be confused and know to avoid it. Yes. And now I'm like, but are there drawings of mushrooms? I don't even know. I'm going to go down a Google wormhole later. <laughs> Can I find these here and how to avoid them? <laughs> Are they saying don't eat these? Or are they saying they grow here? <laughs> well, you know, back to thinking about that, you know, there are places in the world where they serve, you know, in Thailand, they actually make a whiskey that's made out of cobra venom. Like you can actually buy it with the actual snake still in the bottle. Yeah. 
I'm a vegetarian. That feels like it's not for me. <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is probably 60% chance I'm going to die if I drink this. So I will probably avoid it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's an it's a cool decorative piece, but you know, never to open it. Yeah, and I don't know if there's a difference between if you like ingesting the venom, or maybe they've killed, like they've deactivated the venom. I don't know. That's actually a really good question. I hadn't thought about that. And then I've also seen some, it's from South America somewhere and it has like an actual scorpion in it. Well, there's the the, the uh, tequila with the worms in it too. Yeah. Which I've had, but. I mean, that's not that much different except, you know, a neurotoxin doesn't come out of a worm as far as I know. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> I'm not a scientist. I just get paid to do <laughs> be one on YouTube. <laughs> you make it sound like I get paid to do this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I just try to do my best to make it sound like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the trick to public archaeology is it's like you don't have to know everything. You just have to know a little bit more than all the people in the room. <laughs> I just have to be able to make it through the Q&A section of this course. Yes. Yes. Uh, and like the best thing you can say sometimes is, I don't know, but I can look that up for you. And, you know, I can send you to a link that will answer the question for you and I send them to Google. Yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, that was that was one of the some of the best slash worst advice a professor's ever given me is when doing research use Google. I'm like, oh, okay, that's obvious and horribly non-specific. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this could end well or it could end poorly. <laughs> I see myself going down the rabbit hole for several days on this, trying to find the answer to my question. I mean, it is cool to see though. I feel like there's a lot more like open publications that do show up on uh, Google searches that are, you know, peer reviewed and like really good. Yeah, that's one thing, you know, if you're doing archeological research, historical research, things like that, folks, please make sure you're looking for something that is peer reviewed, like a scholarly journal, an academic paper, a government document, those are really good. Things like that, not and not aliens among us in the past. Dot com hashtag aliens <laughs> built the pyramids. Don't do that. I mean, you want to believe that? That's great. I'm not going to fault you for that. Just don't expect me to agree with it. And now we can get on to a whole nother topic for archaeology. Things <laughs> are darker. <laughs> Extraterrestrials. Racism and Extraterrestrials and what to do if you find one in the ground. Tell no, no one. <laughs> because that will turn into a huge government thing that no one will want to work on. <laughs> Can we talk about this to people? No. Can we write about it? No. Can I go home? Absolutely not. Oh. I like that you take the lighthearted approach because it just makes me want to scream at people about racism. <laughs> <laughs> no, no aliens. Oh, uh, I was picturing green people that are coming to steal the pyramids back because they clearly built them. Yeah, if only it was that fun. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's mostly just soil samples and looking at pottery shards or sherds. I got in trouble sure. once. <laughs> I got in trouble once because I didn't know the difference between shard and shard and I wrote it in a paper. And the professor was like, Daniel, you need to pick one and stick with it. <laughs> I was like, well, I don't actually know what the difference is. So I should probably do that before I do anything <laughs> else. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Details, details. <laughs> uh, semantics, semantics. I'll let my professor figure out what which one I actually meant. <laughs> <laughs> So back to the topic we originally came here for, which is <laughs> fermentation. I think it's what we decided we were going to go with. Fermentation, yes. Yes. So when people discovered that this was a process, did it, I mean, did it spread like across cultures or like each culture discovered it on their own? So we think there was independent, I won't say invention, I guess invention is the phrase that we usually use. Uh, no, like people all over the world have figured out fermentation um, and the things that they ferment, once again, are kind of reflective of the things that they have in their environment and the things that they you know, can gather or grow or whatever. Um, but yeah, like people all over the world ferment things. So, and it, and it's not, as I was saying, it's not just like alcoholic beverages or, you know, like people ferment like sauerkraut for, you know, you, how do you get cabbage to last through the winter? Well, you put it in a crock and let it rot, right? You let it ferment and then it is preserved or, um, you know, fish and different, all sorts of things, beans, <laughs> you can see tofu and tempeh, right? It's fermented beans and, um, so yeah, I, it's all over the world and kind of all independently. And I'm sure, you know, we're, as we're talking, the cultures do, cultures do meet and, and share things and all, but um, I think everyone was kind of onto something independently of themselves and then just traded recipes. Well, you know, with the opening of something like the Silk Road or something like that, I can see the process, you know, changing, like somebody from a Western culture, like, Greece or Rome going to like China or something like that seeing the fermentation process and then like refining it I guess because I know the two processes probably wouldn't be the same yeah I mean but, different tools and technology uh, would you definitely see um exchanges of and, and reflected in and um yeah because, you know, I can see, you know, a guy or a woman from China coming to, like, Greece or Rome and seeing, you know, a man in a dress stomping grapes to make wine and thinking that's a little strange. We don't do that there, but, I mean, you do it here, so that's fine. When in Rome. Yeah, but they would go home and make rice wine and ferment. I don't know, all sorts of things. Kimchi, ferment cabbage, right? So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I do like sauerkraut. Sauerkraut's fantastic. Yes. So, um, yeah. Exchanging tools and ingredients and such. It's a, it's a cultural explosion is what I'm going to call it. It is, man. Globalization is and colonialization, as we were saying, is I mean, the world a smaller place. <laughs> colonialization, when we talk about it in you know this kind of context, like fermentation for cultural development and things like that, was great. And you know, it's an exchange of goods, processes, things like that. But you know, then you also talk about it in a different context and. Uh, colonization globalization kind of ruined the world too well i think there is a nuance to the word clo clo colonization uh like it's not just an ex it's not a, it's not a, an equal exchange you know colonization implies that there's a power struggle and there's there's power dynamics that are happening um and that's you know that's where the negative comes in if it was just a fair exchange in a meeting of the cultures and and you know, it'd be different, but that's not how it's played out and it's not how it continues to play out, so. Yeah, that's, things I think would be a lot less combative in the world if it was just a simple exchange instead of, uh, you know, my culture is better than yours kind of thing. Yeah, and a lot of it uh, becomes capitalism too, you know, trying to, to get, industry going and trying to find better opportunities and you know some of it 
uh, may come with good intentions, but that's, once again, that's not how it ends up, you know, um, and it, it. Well, I mean, everybody, everybody has heard a road that leads to a certain place and it's paved with said good intentions, so. Yeah. And some of it was not good intentions either. So yeah. there you go. A lot of it wasn't either, but um, yeah. Capital Imperial, imperialism slash capitalism. Yeah. Yep. So uh, what else do you want to add to the fermentation beverage political <laughs> revolutionary. We've covered a wide variety <laughs> of topics today. <laughs> we have. Um, well, I would just say if anyone's interested in learning more, um, Patrick McGovern's written several books that are really good. Um, and they're, uh, some, are, some are very academic and some are very kind of more easy reads um, for the public. So that's a really good place to go and learn more about um, ancient beverages. Um, and uh, I encourage folks to go find some of the ancient beverages or, you know, look up some some old recipes for baking bread or, you know, um, it's kind of fun to play around with some of this, this old school stuff. Or if you're going to make pickles next time, don't just reach for the vinegar, right? Throw it in a, in a salt water brine and see what happens. So um, yeah, experimentation is the mother of something. Invention? It's, the, it's the it's the mother of the results of the experimentation. Like here, here's your experiment. Here's what you did. Here's what you get out of that. That's what you get from the experimenting. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's cool. You know, I think the pandemic. A lot of people have like started sourdough starters again, right? Like that's a super yeah, traditional. I, this is a trend I've heard a lot of people have started since they've been in since they've either voluntarily or involuntarily been in quarantine, they've decided to reflect inwards on projects in their home. My parents, <laughs> for, for instance, have started growing vegetables on their porch. Mm -hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's, you know, it, it helps them get through the day and makes it so they don't call me as much. That's great. And it gives them something tasty to eat. <laughs> yes, they, There's I'm not going to lie, they do make some very choice tomatoes. It is a lot of tomatoes, mm -hmm. but it is tomatoes. <laughs> I mean, the thing with gardeners is you're like, oh, I really need two tomato plants, but I should plant 10 because a bunch of them may die. But then somehow you end up with 12 tomato plants at the end of it. And it's like, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> Well, I mean, back then, you know, we didn't have the methods of, you know, pest control that we do now, like the rabbits and the other critters slash varmints, depending on what colloquialism you choose to refer to rodents. <laughs> cute. Yeah. I, I prefer to cute. Rodents are cute yes. until they dig in my plants. So, yes, they are, yeah. they are pesky, too. And correct me if I'm wrong, there is a dead armadillo on your glass, yeah? Yes, uh, there is. It's from a brewery in um, Oklahoma that I went to uh, when SEAC was in Tulsa. And so I thought it was fun. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we are going to wrap this up, I think. Do uh, you have any you know, last minute kind of things you want to throw at our viewers? Um, no, I guess I'll just say if you want to learn more about uh, the Florida public archaeology or what we do, you can visit our website at fpan.us. Yeah, so uh, for those of you who didn't see the first episode, my first guest, Nicole Grenan, she also works for FPAN. It's a great episode. They do a lot of great stuff for Florida archaeology and just people in general. So I definitely recommend checking that out, especially if you're looking for resources to do research or things like that it's really awesome so go check it out and thanks for tuning in with us thanks cheers bye